All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another beautiful fall day. I mean, is this not nice? My goodness. October's been just as lovely as September wasn't. <laughs> A couple of very brief reminders. Um, winter lights, that email that I was promising you is going out later today. And that's December 15th, which is a Thursday at five o'clock. And if you go online to get tickets, it's not difficult, really. You just make sure you pick the right time. If you want to join us, we'd love to have you. Um, cell phones, please turn those off. And I just wanted to thank Alice in advance for the tour that she's going to be giving us a week from tomorrow on the very topic that she's going to be speaking on now. This is awesome. So now, too many things in my hand. Okay, plus no light. <laughs> oh boy. Alice Boone is a curator of education and public programs at the Fleming Museum. She organizes learning opportunities and programming for K through 12 students and teachers, college students and faculty and community visitors of all ages. She's gotta be busy, right? She engages classes across the disciplines at UVM, finding creative ways for more than 60 classes each semester to use the museum's collections and spaces for object study, performance, creative response, and critique. She received her PhD in English and Comparative Literature from Columbia and taught college English and writing for several years at Haverford College, UCLA, and the University of Delaware before moving into the museum field where she was most recently the Women's Board Fellow at the Art Institute of Chicago. She co-curated the Fleming's 2020 exhibit, Reckonings, and curated the Rockwell Kent exhibit currently on view at the museum, the subject of today's talk. Give a warm welcome, please, to Alice Boone. is that this is on. Thank you all. Um, thank you all for having me and, and thank you for the many people who um, helped organize today's talk. Um, I have I, I've corresponded with many of you about planning today and then about planning um, the November 5th uh, tour or tours uh, that we'll, we'll do of the museum. I hope today will be a kind of taste for, uh, that might entice you to come next Saturday, because of course, these pieces will be looking at them on PowerPoint, where they're where they're actually quite large. But looking at them in person is 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 a really unrivaled um, experience because they're such extraordinary pieces. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, the title. Well, the title of this um, presentation is the iconic woodcuts of Rockwell Kent from the Ralph C. Nemec collection. Um, at the Fleming right now, we have these on display as one of our fall exhibitions. Ralph Nemec has the largest Rockwell Kent collection of prints um, in the world and has generously um, uh, loaned them to us for this exhibition. But we'll see um, in, in, a, in a few minutes that I actually have a little asterisk for today. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's about that uh, terminology of a woodcut. We'll be diving deeply today into what that term means and how Rockwell Kent um, grew to uh, master the form. Just, oh, so some of you may be uh, familiar with Kent's work in, his, in painting. Um, he's well known for his landscapes, especially those of, of Northern climates. Um, he spent considerable amounts of time in Greenland, um, in southern uh, Arctic, Antarctic climates, uh, in Tierra del Fuego, in Alaska. Um, and with these paintings, they're, they're really extraordinary oil paintings that are um, marvels of illumination of snow, so that you can really see light glinting off of a glacier or off of a snow scene, and showing you many, many different tonalities of blue and gray and yellow as the illumination of the sun. Uh, Rockwell Kent spent time in Alaska, made this piece, um, and as he is enjoying the kind of solitude of living on a, nearly alone on an island uh, in Alaska with his young son and just one other person where they chopped their own wood and caught their own fish to, to eat, um, he received a package from a friend. 
um, Carl Zegrasser sent him uh, a package that contained a kind of provocation for him. It was the, his uh, Zegrasser's uh, charge to his friend was, why don't you try your hand at wood engraving? So he sent him um, wooden blocks. He sent him engraving tools, paper, ink, um, and, and any other tools he might need. This is a provocation for someone who is used to doing things in these amazing shades of blue and gray, um, and really in, in many, many other shades that oil paints afford him. And instead, a, a woodcut or a wood engraving really gives you two values to work with, black and white. So we wonder, you know, why would his friend send him a provocation like that? It nearly fe feels like a kind of creative dare. Well, Kent had actually been studying the wood engraving and woodcut forms. Um, here's what we have is a list of all of the books that he brought with him to Alaska. And as you're looking at his library, um, I heard some wows from the audience. I, you know, because I have that background in literature, I always want to know what's in someone's library. But when I look at this uh, list, I, you know, I'm, I'm very struck by it because what we can see is that he's studying the works of people like Albrecht Dürer, the great German woodcut artist, or William Blake, who didn't work in wood engravings, but did work in plate engravings for all of his um, extraordinary um, contributions to the engraving genre with these nearly apocalyptic, apocalyptic images. Um, we see him reading a number of great epics, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Edda. Um, we see him reading a lot of Nietzsche, um, the Stake Zarathustra, uh, one of those key uh, books of uh, existential German philosophy. Um, this would come to really combine all together, all of these sources um, in his library, and it would give him his iconic style. This is his very first wood engraving. And if this were my first try at wood engraving, I, I feel like I'd, I'd be really proud of myself. <laughs> and one of the things that I, you know, I always like to ask people when we're looking at it is, how did he take his talents from being a painter into this very constrained form of having to engrave on the surface of a block um, lines that would show absence um, that would reveal themselves as white when it was printed, but then the rest of the block is, is, is present so that you have most, mostly black here. So how did he take that painting talent and apply it to a woodcut? Well, I see him striving for those moody skies that he, he shows so well in the landscapes but he doesn't have blue or gray anymore. Instead, he has only black and white. And so he makes these finely incised lines that nearly show a kind of um, moving sky behind the child picture here. He gives you stars <clears throat> that nearly look like they're in their sort of symbolic form of the five pointed star with rays um, radiating off of it and then illuminated by this sort of dark halo around them that sets them off from that moody sky. We see him working with uh, the modeling of curves and muscles on the child's body. He gets a strong dark outline around the child's form, but then it, you can really see the illumination raking across the child's body so that you can see every curve, every little, um, every, every little uh, bone that's illuminated there. We see him playing around with a texture, let's say, in the child's hair, that curly cue that he repeats again and again. That's him working out a kind of um, stylistic flourish that actually is quite hard to do if you're thinking about the grain of wood. Um, working in those curly cues is really sort of breaking that grain apart. There are many other elements that <clears throat> I find really fascinating about this first wood woodblock engraving. Um, but one of them is especially that little steeple at the bottom there. It nearly looks like we're in Vermont. Um, and, and Kent himself spent time in Vermont, but I have a feeling that it's actually a different kind of reference. I think that it's a reference to Albrecht Dürer, who was the great German uh, woodcut artist who Kent studied as he's beginning to make these, uh, these early uh, wood engravings. 
And you see that um, Durer, I've copied it here. It's a little blurry because it's a low resolution image, but Durer repeats these steeples from the German hillside in so many of his uh, wood or woodcuts. This is obviously a much more uh, technically ambitious and subject, it's a very ambitious subject itself. But I see Kent really learning from his, the person that he modeled his work after and including these little stylistic flourishes to show his debt to, um, to Durer. <clears throat> this is one of the nice things about having a PowerPoint presentation is that I can show you these um, references that not, aren't actually in the show itself, but they get, you, they get to help you make um, sort of deeper connections to things. All right, well, here's where the asterisk appears in today's presentation. Um, there is a, there's a terminology difference between a wood cut, which is a cut a, with the grain of um, a block of wood. If you think of carving into a plank of wood, you can see the way that the grain sort of makes these um, uh, nearly, um, uh, they, they make strong horizontal lines so that you're pulling out splinters of wood versus carving into the grain itself of the, the end grain. Um, that is the short grains as though you flipped that plank of wood over. That allows you to get a much uh, finer engraving and finer line um, moved into the wood. Kent himself used these terms interchangeably. He actually wrote a book called How I Make a Woodcut while working almost predominantly in the wood engraving genre. And so sometimes even in the Fleming's collection, those terms get used uh, interchangeably and they actually are quite different in not only their technique, but also in what you notice about them. And I'll give you just one example that is in this Fleming show. Um, here we have a, a great example of a wood cut by the artist Ron Slayton, who is a Vermont um, artist who has worked really flourished during the Works Progress Administration. And you can see that, that Slayton's style looks nothing like Albrecht Durer. Um, it is going for this sort of rough hewn gouges in wood. He is cutting with the grain of wood so that he can pull out large splinters of it. Um, we spend a little bit of time on um, Slayton's work in the Fleming show, and I'm excited for you all to see that in person if you, if you come uh, next Saturday. Um, we did so in order to not only show you the stylistic difference, but also to think about how this idea of what a woodcut could be became so popular for artists like Kent and Slayton, even as they work in different aesthetics, as they're thinking about how to get art made accessible to a wide group of people, starting really in the 1920s and 30s. There's an idea of how do, how do you make art accessible to everyone, which I feel like is a great topic for this group, right? Education and enrichment for everyone. This is a key idea for Kent himself. He's thinking about how only one person, say, sees a painting, or only one person possesses a painting. But if we can make prints, then many people can have access to owning and appreciating art. So he can make editions of, say, 75 or 100 and distribute them. And this way, many people can access the, the, the real joy of, of owning a piece of art. He and many artists are experimenting with these means of reproduction and they don't see it as copying. They see it as everyone gets an original because every pull of a print is actually slightly different from another based on the way that the ink is applied based on the print that's, that's, that's made. So he sees this as everyone having access to originals and the engraving process <laughs> for him is a way of redistributing access. Here's another one of Kent's um, kind of iconic images. And you'll see how different it is from that, uh, that bluebird print that we began with. One of the obvious differences is that this is a, a black outline on a mostly white print. Whereas the other that we saw was mostly white lines on a black background. And the technical difference here is that in this, in this print, most of the surface of the wood has been removed so that only the outline is left as a relief. 
so that it's printing only that black outline. Whereas in the others, right, we had that black background and the, in, the incised designs were actually done in white. He mostly works in the other kind, that uh, white on black, but this one is notable, I think, for him, again, once again, trying that star illumination. This will become, again, a kind of icon for him. So here he has these white stars illuminated by this dark outline and then this hints of the illumination around them. Here, I think that he's really referencing the great English poet, radical, and engraver William Blake. So if you remember <clears throat> uh, the songs of innocence and experience, um, William Blake loved this figure of the lamb um, as a kind of poetic icon of, of childhood innocence. And Kent was drawn to that as well. Uh, William Blake is an engraver who really finds ways of experimenting with all kinds of graphic design on his pages made at the end of the 18th century. Um, so he writes his poems and then he has these illuminations around it. But he also has much more apocalyptic scenes. Um, the, this is from an engraved uh, edition of the Book of Job. Um, and I, I won't spend too much on it. I really only want to draw your attention to the stars at the top. Those stars look familiar, don't they? This is a kind of a visual reference that Kent is pulling from and then remaking in his own work. Here you see another, this is another William Blake um, engraving from that book of Job and the illumination behind that top figure's head. Well, he, a, an artist like Kent who's drawn so much to illumination on snow <laughs> is now drawn to how you do that in a wood engraving. Here's Kent working from paint form, the ways that the rays radiate um, out in these concentric circles and making these shapes across the water. And here is Kent adopting that in this wood engraving style. So again, he only has two values, black and white, that becomes a kind of creative challenge for him as to how to make this illumination look like this. So I believe he really turns to William Blake to think about those things. But a piece like this, this is called Twilight of Man. It is a, um, it's an illustration that he made, a woodcut, wood, wood engraving illustration for a poem by Thomas Hardy that imagines kind of the end of humanity. But what I find really striking about this is that for Hardy, the poet, the end of humanity is this moment of sort of grief, maybe somewhat, somewhat of nostalgia, but Kent has turned it into a scene of real beauty, I think, here. Um, and I see that really in those rays that are illuminating from the moon. You can nearly, you can't really tell whether this is day or night at first. You can see the stars on the dark part of the background, but this dark sun or dark, dark moon that's radiating black rays just feels like such a revelation as a, as a, as a kind of artistic um, experiment in how you make illumination with black on white. The, the moonlight is raking across this figure who's slumbering. For Thomas Hardy, the poet, this slumbering was a kind of um, a reproach of humanity, but I see something more hopeful in Kent's image. I really see this as illuminating him and turning him into one with the landscape so that you can nearly not tell who's a hill and who's a person here. Um, this is again, that modeling that we noticed in the first wood engraving that he did. Here, he's really adopted it into something that's even more abstract. Here is The Lovers from 1928. Um, once again, we have that illumination raking across these bodies so that they once again looked abstract. An artist like Kent is used to painting landscapes and so he, he always wants to find where his light is, but he's actually bringing so many other professional experiences into this work. He, he was a, a set designer 
And this to me looks like a stage set or even something like it's anticipating a noir film uh, 20 years later. So he's thinking about how, how bodies are lit. This is a woodcut that is mostly that black background. Only these slivers of the illuminated faces and bodies pop out from that very, very dark inky, um, inky rectangle around them. All right, well, here's the pop quiz. Since we're now experts in what is a woodcut and what is a wood engraving, I want to ask you, what medium is this? We think it's a wood engraving because I told you that Kent makes very, very few wood cuts. All right. Um, this is a, this, I like to call this a Fleming mystery. Oh, yes. Don't they? Because they're how he makes that um, that sky, right? This is something that woodcut artists have done for centuries, is made that uh, that gray sky out of those finely incised white lines, but they're irregular here that, ex that would seem to suggest that it's the splinters that have been gouged out. This is a Fleming mystery because in our collections database, it has all of the information about these pieces. This is listed as a woodcut. But knowing what I had researched about Rockwell Kent, I, was, I thought to myself, well, is it really a woodcut? Because that would be rare. I did not know how deep this mystery was going to get because I went to Rockwell Kent's um, own book um, of his works uh, where he talks about his process. There are a number of essays that he's written about, the, about um, his technique, but also his wider social work. Um, and he describes this piece. It's actually a little, it's a little tiny thumbnail of it in the book as a pen and ink drawing. And I was flummoxed. And so I started inviting people to the museum to hear their thoughts on it and feel, feel like figure out what their hypotheses were. Um, I, I guess I'm saying this on television. Um, I touched it which you're, you're not really supposed to do. I did it with gloves on. I just wanted to see where the ink sat on the page because if it were, you know, I felt like I could see, maybe see the, um, or feel the way that the, the ink was sitting there. Was it, had it, had it been pressed on? Had it, was it sitting on top of the page? Had I, could I feel the, maybe the strokes of the pen? I smelled it to see if the, if the scent of uh, woodblock ink was still there. It's about a hundred years old, so no. And then I went to, you know, I went to Google and I did a reverse image search of it. And it turned up um, actually as a poster image that Kent had designed in 1921 um, for the Junior Arts League. But that didn't quite help me because I, it, it didn't tell me what the original was. This was given to the Fleming Museum by a man named Henry Schnockenberg, who uh, was a Vermont artist, spent quite a bit of time in New York, was friends with Rockwell Kent, and who gave the Fleming many, many objects in the collection. And so we thought, well, okay, Henry Schnockenberg is his friend, so maybe this is the original. And we're, we're, we have a number of original drawings that Schnockenberg gave us. Maybe this is it. Then I found at the Minnesota Institute of Art that they have the original pen and ink drawing. So that, that then led to the question, well, what is this? This is a photomechanical reproduction of a pen and ink drawing meant to look like a woodcut. <laughs> and that might seem very esoteric, but the deeper question for me is why? <laughs> why would he make a photomechanical reproduction of a pen and ink drawing meant to look like a woodcut? And for me, that you know, as I looked more into his work, I found that he did this all the time. So in his book, Wilderness, which is his account of living in Alaska, um, he, you see him making these kinds of illustrations. This too looks like a woodcut, but this is also a pen and ink drawing. So he's mimicking the form of a woodcut in order to work out this aesthetic that's very important to him. 
that aesthetic confers authenticity. That is, it confers the kind of labor that goes into engraving into a block of wood. It confers the authenticity of calling back to Albrecht Durer or to the, um, the, the radical printmaker William Morris in the 19th century who, who really tied woodcut aesthetics to the labor of, of tilling in the fields. So just as this little harvester figure here has a scythe, Kent is pretending that he himself has a gouge that is gouging into a block of wood. He does this work over and over again in his career. Um, and it becomes a kind of aesthetic that confers that, that sense of um, solidarity with laborers, um, with the, the toughness of making all of these wood engravings. But he uses that aesthetic to make all of the illustrations for Moby Dick. Um, he makes 280 of them, all of them mimicking that woodcut style. This piece, um, this drawing of um, the Ubermensch from Friedrich Nietzsche's Thus Spake Therathustra, um, this is a kind of uh, meditation he was making, again, in Alaska as he's doing all of this deep reading and transforming his own aesthetics. And this figure will recur over and over again in Kent's work, such that it nearly becomes a kind of um, calling card for him or what the van editors of Vanity Fair called an indelibly Rockwell Kent figure. Um, this, uh, this illustration is a lithograph, which is a different kind of print. The Fleming Show has many of those, and I will be excited to show you all those there. But I included him here because you re recognize him as he recurs across Kent's work. He is the strong, massive silhouette, the dogmatic line, the note of mysticism, the tactical hardness, almost of woodenness. So here's that wood again. All employed in the presentation of a lonely, dramatic, and mysterious figure of man thrust up against the desolate, inimical sky. So this figure will recur in Kent's work. Here he is on a ship. Um, I, these two figures have, have really captivated people um, as they have come to visit the Fleming, and they captivated Kent's, uh, Kent's admirers at the time as he adapted both of these figures into multiple book plates for private commissions. I love this figure because he, he's not quite the same as that tactical hardness of the man that we saw on the cliff in Pinnacle just now. This figure seems to be poised between grasping aspiration, right? That hand that's reaching into the, hand, into the sky or hands, and then repose of lying uh, probably on the deck of a ship, one knee raised, ready to spring into action, but also one knee down in order to rest. These two figures really, like, they're illuminated by that starry sky behind him. Notice he's not making those um, symbol, symbolic stars with the five points anymore. He's, he's grown more confident in his ability to create different kinds of illumination, such that we see something like the Milky Way behind him in one scene, or this undulating flame in the other. Um, when you look up close at these in person, you'll see that he's carved these very, very, very fine white lines that suggest the rays coming off of the, the flame here. Um, but they're nearly too hard to see in a, a kind of blown up PowerPoint. That's how fine they are. That's the craft that we're really thinking about. Oh, he calls this uh, a kind of, uh, well, he calls this his, his style. And other, other curators who've worked with, with Kent, um, Kent's work have called it a kind of dark sublime, a trembling in awe before the inky darkness. And the illumination is just there to show you a bright way to go, but it's, it, it's small in comparison to the large sea that's around you. I think that he's really drawing from the, the kind of dares that Japanese woodblock printmakers would give each other to create different kinds of illumination in their own woodblock engravings. 
So the Japanese um, woodblock engravers like um, Hiroshige um, or, or Suzuki Kasson here, they, they're notable, this is in color, of course, but they're always trying to find different ways of showing illumination of fire on water or of fireworks or other kinds of illumination. It's nearly a kind of creative uh, constraint like the one that Kent was working with. Here, he's really working in just black and white. So this is bowsprit um, from 1930. More of that Milky Way illuminating the figure here. The light source is showing off every kind of, every kind of muscle in his calf. But for those realists in the audience, we're wondering, what is he doing? Naked on the, on the bow, on the bow sprit, <laughs> uh, with, uh, with only lit by the sun or, or only lit by, by the stars around him. What is he up to? What is he up to here, clinging to the mast with the, uh, the rays of some kind of illumination around him? What are these figures? Well, I'm sure that no one in here is going to guess that these were originally yacht advertisements. So Rockwell Kent is not showing you the product in this ad advertisement. He's showing you the aspiration. <laughs> this sense of freedom, of liberation, all of it you're sort of grasping to as you grasp the, as you grasp the ship itself. Um, so these were made as advertisements for American Car and Foundry. They ran actually without text. So you're just seeing the image, just seeing the, getting the feeling of what he wants to present to you. Um, this was such a popular initially confounding ad campaign that it actually was celebrated in an advertising annual as advertising that breaks the rules. So it's not going to present, this is what the luxury yacht is, here are all the gleaming, you know, the gleaming mechanisms of it. No, it's showing you the sense of what you might aspire to or imagine if you were on it. His adver advertising career really paid his bills and it made his work iconic. That is, it appeared in, in magazines like Vanity Fair, both as advertisements, but also as his work in House Illustrator. It appeared in Christmas cards. Rockwell Kent loved Christmas. And <laughs> I, you know he loved Christmas for, I think, sentimental family reasons, but I think also because it was a perfect place for him to try out as many forms of this illumination as possible. So here's a, a child reaching to put the star on top of a Christmas tree. The Christmas tree has been rendered nearly abstract as just a black triangle with these little candles illuminating it. And really the focus is on, again, that sense of aspiration, of reaching for something. Um, here is another form of that black on uh, white on black, where instead of being illumination of stars, we're actually seeing underwater. So this is bubbles from a whale in an inky sea. As I noted um, in my initial asterisk, this looks like a woodblock print in the way that he's made these finely incised lines like we saw in that initial bluebird, but is in fact a pen and ink drawing. Kent made those 280 illustrations for Moby Dick over a four year period. That's a lot of illustrations for a very big book. And the creativity that he showed in creating 280 different illustrations to show that the real um, encyclopedic nature of Melville's book, it's just really inspiring. Um, it became a kind of, um, icon of the story itself, arguably that Lakeside Press edition, which was published in three editions in 1930, really helped make uh, Moby Dick into a canonical American novel, where it had initially been thought of as a failure when it was first published in the 19th century. So these images, these icons of it, helped bring it into the American consciousness as a quintessentially American story. Um, I love these pen and ink drawings that again, look like woodcuts, 
um, just for the, the kind of variety of the action here. You'll notice that Melville's name doesn't even appear on the, on the, on the cover. It's so much a Kent production. Um, Kent continues making these kinds of um, commercial endeavors. Here is a Christmas gift um, that he, he produced as a, it, it's a, essentially it's a gift for the employees of the Weyerhaeuser Timber Company. Um, everyone got a chiaroscuro wood engraving as a gift that would appreciate in value later on. Um, chiaroscuro is another, it's a, it's a, essentially it's an adaptation of the wood engraving form where you're printing with two colors, that, that ochre and then the black in order to produce different kinds of illumination and shadow. And it's a, it's a technique that um, many, many different kinds of, uh, many different artists have experimented in. But I love how here he takes that again, that inimical sky, the hard wooden man, and here he is actually chopping wood. And the way that the color washes across him only enhances that stylistic um, iconicity that Kent's work has. This is again, not a wood engraving, but I thought I would share it with you all as Vermonters because in 1936, Kent, um, who had attained some fame as an artist, um, but also as a labor supporter and leftist artist, Kent was called to West Rutland um, by the strike aid committee for the workers who were on strike against the Proctor um, Marble Company. Uh, they had been on strike for months, they weren't receiving wages, and so the strike aid committee asked Kent to come in and raise awareness, and also money by selling um, uh, editions of his artwork that would promote the workers' cause. Kent was more than happy to do so. He had actually supported the Lakeside Press workers, that is the people who had produced Moby Dick, um, in their own strike earlier in that, in that decade. Um, so here, this 1936 illustration focuses on the workers' families and the, and the, and the hardship that it created for them. We note on the design itself that it says 1775 in one corner and then the date of the strike, 1936 in the other. 1775 is a key kind of date for Kent to refer to, especially for Vermonters, because it links the work, the strikers with Ethan Allen. So he quotes Allen below um, in the name of Jehovah and the Continental Congress. He's linking Ethan Allen, that sort of marker of independence in Vermont, with these strikers which is a very canny move on his part because the strike had divided the town. And so he, he provides a kind of figure that they can all aspire to that unites them. And then he, he and others preside over this public um, hearing where workers shared their stories. Kent also produced um, illustrations that, that were similar to this one. This is the cover of New Masses from 1937. This is Workers of the World Unite. And, uh, you know, to compare this to Kent's first um, woodblock illustration from, the, from, from 1918 is really to see him recurring many of those stylistic flourishes, this time with clouds of, of um, smoke in the inimical sky that's behind him. But he's still showing off that technique of all the different ways that he can illuminate something that is immaterial then we have this figure who's lit such that you can see every single muscle modeled. He's carrying a, a shovel. He's poised and ready for action. He has that, that um, landscape behind him. But I always wonder where are the other workers here, right? This is about solidarity. It's about uh, like promoting unions. Then where are the other ones? But remember that initial description from Vanity Fair of the single man thrust up against the sky. It is as though Kent really can't, uh, he, he can't do groups of people in the same way that he can do these single, single figures. And maybe that's actually the constraint of working in a woodblock, which is a relatively small 
um, format. So he decides to focus on one to give you that sense of people unified. That is the end of my presentation because that is uh, that that's sort of where we get to with Kent's woodcuts, but I or wood engravings as we as we now know. Um, but I um, am eager to show you more of his lithographs, which extend his political art making, um, as as you're able to come to the Fleming. I'm I'm happy to take any questions now. Yes. You want to hold off one second so I so we can get this so we can all hear. What do you think the 1775 to 1936 meant right there on that picture? So I believe he's linking this date of the I have another question. I he's linking the date of the strike with Ethan Allen's own um, act of defiance um, in Vermont. So he's linking the Continental Congress and the move to re remove themselves from the yoke of the British with removing themselves with, from the yoke of the boss here in Rutland. Mm -hmm. So this is, his, um, this is his tie to Vermont's favorite son, Ethan Allen here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And on the pre preceding picture, I've never seen that word before, the faller. The? Faller, or was that faller? Faller. Oh, oh, that's an L. Okay, then I get it. Yep, he's, he's, uh, he's working on the tree um, as, a, uh, as, as a timber man there. A comment on the last picture that you showed us, uh, the solitary man mm -hmm. has so much more impact than any group could ever have had. I, I, I agree with you. I think that's why Kent draws from it iconically, even as he is a part of many, many unions or many unions um, and is always supporting solidarity of groups of people, his icon really can only be a single solitary person here. Um, I am wondering if I'm going way back here now, if, but if a copy of one of his uh, woodcuts or wood blocks was shown in the written Candide. Oh, I'm so glad that you asked because Candide is my favorite book. Um, his, uh, Kent indeed produced the illustrations for Candide they are fine um, pen and ink drawings that don't do many of the same kind of um, dramatic skies here. Instead, they're very simple um, horizontal uh, uh, vignettes that are some of my favorite. It's my favorite edition of Candide, and I've seen nearly every edition of Candide. I curated the Candide um, at 250 years uh, show at the New York Public Library several years ago. So I got to see every edition and every way that those uh, unusual vignettes from that globe-trotting story are illustrated. Kent produced um, 95 color, hand-colored um, illustrations for that for the first edition of Candide in uh, 1928, and uh, there's you know there's 95 of them, so there's not that many. UVM Library, the Special Collections, has a first edition of the non-color edition, um, which is itself very special and very beautiful to look at, um, but it's not the hand-colored one. Um, my favorite thing about the candy that Kent produced is that, uh, and you'll have to see this if you come to the exhibit, is that he produced these little tiny, I mean, they're smaller than, uh, they're smaller than my fingernail. Um, little figures that are in every, next to every sentence. They just seem to be, they, they, everyone is in a different pose. Um, he calls them dingbats. So that it appears that there's little tiny figures floating among the text. And if you recall the story of Candide is about what humanity looks like in 1759 after the earthquake, to see all of these writhing figures is to be reminded of humanity literally in every line. It really speaks to what a special um, what a special illustrator he was that he worked so intimately on book design with um, with printers who 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 were creating the book. Um, his woodblock printer Elmer Adler, who kind of 
every printer has to have, uh, or every time an artist makes a print, they really often work with master printers in order to make sure that the, you know, the press is working correctly. Um, and his collaboration with Elmer Adler, who did all of his wood, woodblock engravings, was a friendship that would last him for, for his life and would create many professional opportunities for him, including working on these deluxe editions. So Elmer Adler was not only a, a, a master printer, he was really more of like an impresario who created these opportunities, professional opportunities for Kent to try his hand at different kinds of printing. In this ride, the destiny of, destiny of man, uh, on the uh, left of the uh, structure, uh, the woodcut, uh, there's a bunch of structures on a hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering if this is making reference to skyscrapers or to maybe uh, stone heads type of uh, things or did he meant to leave it as a question mark? Uh, what a great question. I guess I have always seen them as Stonehenge-like, but I love this possibility that they also could be more contemporary and that we're actually, we, the ambiguity of the image, which is something that artists kind of love to play around with, the ambiguity is whether it is something that is calling back to an elemental part of man or to something that man has produced. <laughs> um, it's a great, it's, it, I feel like I'll, I'll, I'll use that line in the rest of my tours um, because I, I think that's a great ambiguity to question there. Most people have tended to see it as Stonehenge, as Mesolith, uh, or it is something monolithic, but it is indeed more than that um, in, in how it is reaching both to the past and to the, to the possibility of no future. Speaking of ambiguity, mm -hmm. what I see in that picture is a, um, to the left, our left of the moon or the, the light is praying hands. Oh. At just, you can see fingers. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. That's really wonderful. Is that, it, again, that the way that the light illuminates and then suggests figures really does give you the opportunity to see to, to see more in a, in a rock face. Um, speaking of this picture, since you have it up, I'm also seeing what is sort of like a claw-like hand underneath the skyscrapers or the Stonehenge, uh -huh. you know, oh, reaching yep. back toward the body. Uh, what I really wanted to ask about though was the, the one with the mast, um, just really strikes one as a cross. Yes. I'd wondered if that was reading too much into it. No, I don't think it's reading too much into it at all. Okay. Um, you know, a cross is never just a cross. Right. Um, and it, 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 this, one, this one I find very interesting because he, he actually makes a painting form of it 10 years earlier, more than 10 years earlier, um, which uh, really, it, it doesn't have this same kind of virtuosity of the, the rays illuminating and the waves beneath him. It really does focus only on the figure and the, the mass, the cross above him. And I, I, you know, this does have all of that Christian symbolism, but my eye actually always goes downward to the virtuosity of the waves behind him and the rays. And I nearly feel a kind of competition <laughs> between Kent and that Christian Im imagery where it, it, it's there, but he really wants to show off how he can do waves. <laughs> um, just one more, if I may, um, mm -hmm. the, the faller. Um, again, it's sort of unclear to me what he's standing on. It appears to be like a plank set into the middle of the height of the tree. That's what it is. That's the, that's the technology that they were using. It is why so many um, 
timber company workers went on strike for <laughs> for their for for added safety precautions. Um, and I, I actually, I never looked into it to see whether the Weyerhaeuser t timber company workers ever went on strike, like so many of the other actual um, corporations and companies that he produced imagery for, like they did, like Lakeside Press, or like U.S. Steel. Um, we don't have any of the U.S. Steel uh, wood, wood engravings in the Fleming show, but he produced these, again, these like very muscular men working at the steel yard very same year, U.S. Steel goes on strike, which for an, for someone who is working for them, who's getting a paycheck for them, but who also supports labor rights, is actually kind of a it's an it's a productive, generative contradiction that he has to work through as an artist. my mind goes to the technique of how did he do this and artists often make sketches beforehand of how they do it and so do you know whether they did they'd work with white paint on dark on dark paper black paper or oh that's a great question um i don't know the answer to that um I, I, you know, I've seen the painting versions of some of these when he had, he is essentially adapting his own work, but I have not seen the sketches of any of the wood engravings. I have seen the the sketches that he made for Moby Dick and for Candide, which were you know pencil drawings that then turned into pen and ink drawings. But his tech, like his process for sketching out what a wood engraving looks like, I it, that's a great thing to look more into. You have to think in reverse. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Actually, at the in the Fleming uh, exhibition, we have a whole room um, of um, Vermont artists who are responding to Kent's work um, or uh, taking up that same question as to how you produce originals in print form for more people to show social messages. So Ron Slayton, this woodcut artist, is one of those artists. But Francis Colburn, whose name might be familiar to some of you as a Vermont artist, we actually have this wonderful, wonderful um, demonstration kit that he um, produced for the Works Progress Administration that is how you make a wood engraving. And he shows the white paint on a black background in taking you through the steps of how you make a wood engraving. He, he does a very tiny little block to show you the process, but this demonstration box would have been used as a teaching aid for people to realize that like anybody can make a woodcut. That turns out not to be true um, as I have tried to make a woodcut and ran the gouge through my thumb, um, but many people can make a woodcut. Um, <laughs> Anyway, these, these demonstration boxes we found in the Fleming's collection. We also have a how to make a lithograph and how to make a lino cut, um, which is a linoleum print. And they are wonderful artifacts of the Works Progress Administration. Um, this sense of sending artists out to teach others to make art, to democratize the art making process. Um, and to you know they they they've they've seen where because they were used in and traveled around but they're incredible artifacts of this belief of this experiment really to put art and art making tools in the hands of many people um and and to see them is just a real delight great we have a zoom question in what ways if any were kent's artworks influenced by the wartime experiences of americans Oh, that's a great question, and it's one that I think uh, is especially illustrated in his um, lithographs, which I didn't include in this presentation. Um, as, an, as, uh, as a leftist artist, um, he raised the alarm, let's say, of the rise of fascism um, during the Spanish Civil War in the, in the 1930s as the Nazis came to power. Um, he has an, a really remarkable painting that was then turned into a lithograph, a print um, that's called uh, Heavy, Heavy Hangs Over Thy Head of a Sleeping Baby with a Gun 
a rifle suspended over its head and then a rat gnawing at the strap that's holding the rifle. He produces this in 1945 as an illustration of just the kind of po the, 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 the dread that is setting upon people. Um, he warns against the rise of fascism in the United States um, as he's called to testify before the House of Un-American Activities Committee. Um, and then he, he, he refuses to answer their questions and says he's not a communist, um, but he uh, pays the price professionally for that, has his passport revoked um, and ends up um, actually sending much of his work over to the Soviet Union. So that wartime experience, um, it doesn't radicalize him because he was already radical, but it gives him the opportunity to use the printmaking medium to spread a message in as many different forms of media as possible. That baby, uh, the heavy, heavy hangs over his, over thy head. It sounds like a grim idea, but it was actually a Christmas card. It was his Christmas card in 1945. Um, that's, that's what the wartime experience had done to him. Anyone else? This has been terrific. Really, really interesting. Thank you so much, Alice. Thank you. Thank you all. And I, I really do encourage you to come to the Fleming if you can, um, or his works are available so widely um, that um, it's, it's wonderful to just sort of search out and see how many different pieces he made um, and how ubiquitous his style could become um, as he worked in advertising, book illustration book illustrations and political illustrations next Saturday. Next Saturday. Yes. Yes. At 1230. And I, I, I said to um, Betty that I would be happy to do one at 130 if there were too many people, because we want to have a nice intimate conversation like this one has been. Um, so I'm happy to do it twice if there, if there's a lot of people who are interested. And we checked out the parking. Oh. And there's a good size lot that seems to not be that busy between the, the Ira Allen Chapel and the Fleming. So there's a, there's a what, what, if you were going towards the lake on Colchester Avenue, past the hospital, there is a turn there. It's not marked with a name that leads you into really, I think there'll be plenty of parking. I, I, if you use that lot uh, between the Fleming and it, it's, it is west of the Fleming, um, between Ira Allen Chapel and the museum, that lot is is large. There's a smaller lot that is between the hospital and the museum. That one could fill up. Um, so the, you have you have ample parking in the other spaces. Yeah. Well, there's a there's a dedicated museum parking lot that fills up quickly. It's that, small. That's but, the one. If you're going up to the hospital, it's on the right. But there's also on the weekends the ability to park in the big lot, which I recommend. Yes. Good. Well, hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you so much.